Hi, I'm Das Smith and today I want to share with you a remote viewing project that is over 25 years in the making. It's one of the most witnessed UFO events in modern history and one that has potential implications and history going back decades, but also has future effects that may affect generations to come. This presentation essentially comes in two halves. The first half is remote viewing and the remote viewing segment of this video was initially created as part of a Farsight Institute project in 2015. The live recorded video by myself and Dick Augar was then used in a Farsight documentary behind a paywall. Both Dick and I created our remote viewing live on whiteboard in front of a camera and we were both totally blind to what the actual target was. The second half of this presentation is a February 2023 interview with one of the leading lights, experts and witnesses to the main public event and much, much more. The actual 2015 remote viewing target and focus of this presentation was a March 13th, 1997 mass sighting of a UFO over the city of Phoenix. Phoenix experienced a UFO event whereby a series of widely sighted, unidentified flying objects were observed in the skies over the state of Arizona and Nevada. Lights of varying descriptions were seen by thousands of people over the space of 300 miles. There were two distinct events involved in the incident, a triangular formation of lights seen to pass over the state and witnesses reported seeing a large V-shaped object traveling southeast. There was also a series of stationary lights seen in the Phoenix area. After the remote viewing, we'd also present an interview with Dr. Lin. Dr. Lin is an internationally acclaimed physician and health educator who pushed aside her successful medical career to pursue the Phoenix Lights in a book and an internationally award-winning documentary project. In this insightful and thought-provoking interview, Dr. Lin sheds light on the remote viewing data by adding feedback and new details amassed over the last 26 years with amazing revelations and new details on the events in question that have huge consequences for mankind and how UFOs, more commonly known as UAPs nowadays, and how these are shaping and guiding human consciousness. I hope you enjoy both the remote viewing and also the Dr. Lin interview with the amazing information and implications from both. Okay, so let's see how we get with this. Okay, so there's definitely land. And this rises and it's natural. It's outside. B. It's definitely a structure or structures. And these are integrated all marine the land. There's sea. The sea feels like it's rising. Feels like it's a structure. Feels like it's above. Solid. Moving maybe. Hard, dense, definitely above. Okay, so where were we? There's land, there's, which is a natural one, is outside. Uh, it feels like there's structure in and on the land. Um, and it feels like a rising structure above the land, which is solid, feels like it's moving, hard, dense, feels like it's above, feels like it's rising upwards. I get this sense of direction, upwards direction. 
linear. Um, this feels like, oh. Feels like some kind of, I do feel straight edges to it. It feels rising, pointed, diamond shaped. Um, it feels kind of like, That in shape, um, domed rising, a uh, uh, flatter bit on the bottom than on the top or something. Kind of structure feels dense, hard, solid, shiny, um, slick. Slick if I touch it. Smooth, possibly metallic. It's shiny. Feels like it has a yeah smoothness, a slick slickness to it. Uh, there are seamed edges. Uh, it does feel like there's it's made of parts that touch, but I can't feel the seams. I can almost a little bit see them, but I can't feel them. Um, it feels like it may have some kind of writing or carved kind of. I don't want to say hieroglyphics. Um, images, indented, carved type images. I. Uh, on part of the surface of the structure. It feels like it's in linear bands of some kind of angular, yeah, angular type writing on the surface of this structure. Okay, let's just see what else we got here. Try another ideogram here to see what we pick up. Try to get some good contact. Okay, so land. Definitely have a land here. And we definitely have a life here. And there's an interaction in energy here. And the interaction is between life uh, and the life is here and it's like they're pointing and looking up, looking above. They're interacting with something above them. Towering above them. Now the energy is wild. I can hear it. It's humming. Loud. It's really intense. Like a low penetrating hum. Penetrating. And it feels it feels artificial mechanical. in nature. Um, and the hum and the energy feels like it's here. So above and in front of the life. outwards as well so wow okay so there's an energy that feels like it's a force downwards but there's also a feeling of an energy which is radiating outwards it seems to be coming from a solid angular looking sleek shiny metallic structure which seems to be raised or rising or above it seems to be above the land above the life form looking at it
So let's have another go. Very interesting so far. Okay, so let's try to sketch this thing above. Okay, so it's anger, and there's definitely a motion here. There's a motion, and there's a structure which has angles, sharp edges. And I don't know, it's kind of strange. Um, if I were to sketch it, it kind of feels I want to, I want to say pyramidal, but it's not pyramidal. Uh, it's almost like I don't know if this is right though. It feels like it has an edge to it, a, a lower edge and a, and a top edge. It feels like two parts to it, uh, almost like a diamond shape. Um, but then when I when I, I feel it, it doesn't. Uh, uh, it kind of also feels curved in Angier. Um almost like it changes shape, it's almost like a structure that can change shape or, or appears to change shape. Why would that be? Maybe, maybe it's an illusion or something, something to do with energy, I don't know. Because it does glow. Uh, we have this kind of, I don't know. Also structured object, angular edges. It feels like it rises above me. It feels like it's got sharp edges, very clean lines to it. But also within the clean lines, it feels fuzzy. The whole shape feels fuzzy, and it feels like it's like, it feels like it's glowing. It feels like it, you know you'd be able to see it bright from miles around. But yeah, you know, it feels like it's like glowing light. Um, but here it feels like fuzziness, hazy, kind of, um, it feels like it's giving off like a hazy gas type energy, um, I can't quite describe it. The edges feel like, if you're looking at the edges, they feel um, out of focus, blurred. As if obscured by a mist or something, um, an energy. No, uh, distortion. Distortion. Yeah, maybe it's maybe some kind of energy distortion. Um, or light or something. But what's happening anyway is it's almost like it's. I tell you what it's like, it's like it's shimmering. It's like you're looking at a candle or something and you change your shape, you see the shimmering at the, at the light of it. It feels a bit like that around the edges of, of, of this structure. So it's quite hard to pin down the exact shape of it. Yeah, shimmering. Almost like it's moving alive. I can, if I'm close to the, sorry, if I'm close to the structured object now, and I'm almost becoming the structured object. I can feel the edges of it and they feel like they're shaking and moving slightly in and out, vibrating, but they're not. I can feel it underneath. It's just that it's giving this kind of energy, glow, mistiness around it that's, um, yeah, causing this illusion. So it's very hard to, it's very hard to determine its actual hard shape or does it change shape even it may even change shape which is weird because you know at this point <laughs> obviously I would have to AOL something like a UFO and I don't think I've done a UFO target for Courtney yet so I don't know if we do one <clears throat> very strange very strange target um, anything else not that I'm aware of but you know we have this we have this um, uh, you know, I don't want to, we have this linear type shining 
morphing structure here um, and we have this life form here that it seems to be interested in it. a main life form it seems to be male <clears throat> there may be others around I'm not sure but it seems to be I'm seem to be having the my focus is drawn to what looks like a, a male um, and there are structures down here as well in the land um, and this feels past it feels like a past event So have this life form, looking up, observing, and interacting with with a structure, and it seems to be, it seems to be rising, but at some point it came downwards, and that's when it was seen by the life. It was seen on a descend motion, uh, and the life form feels male, feels like it's in the past. Um, he feels small, skinny, athletic in stature. Feels like he has a uh, dark complexion, dark hair. Um, doesn't feel like a modern man. This does feel, you know, past. Feels, I don't want to say, it feels a, a little bit primitive in their thinking, their, their social structure, their life. And the way he's interacting with this as well, it feels like feels like ancient man from the past or something that's kind of <laughs> seen some kind of uh, advanced structure or technology or something that's beyond their comprehension and they're, they're pointing at it, looking at it in awe. I can feel the wonderment of building this in, in this life. It's something that's going to affect, if it's going to affect him for the rest of his life and it um, inspires them, inspires them to replicate or try to replicate what they're observing. For all intents and purposes it feels like, you know, some kind of like, again an AOL here, it's kind of like Star Trek type uh, first contact type thing. Where uh, uh, some kind of low-level civilization is um, plunged into contact with a uh, technologically advanced civilization, and they're just stood there watching them, what would appear to be magic to them, unfold. unfold. Um, they just seem to be in awe, looking upwards, almost treating it like a spiritual, godlike event. Um, because I guess. What they're seeing uh, is like, yeah, it's like godlike powers to to, to, the, to this life. As I said, it affects them. Uh, they spend the rest of their life enthralled by this, trying to emulate this this first encounter or this first experience, trying to make sense of it. I think. Okay, so let's move on a little bit then. Let's see what else we get. Let's try and move inside this uh, this structure. Let's see what we get from that. Inside. So let's do a quick movement here from A to B and B being inside. Okay. It feels, uh, feels domed. It feels like this, domed, let's say. And it feels ringed inside. Um, but there is a column, central column. So it's layered, circular. Uh, there are linear elements, but not many inside. Um, there's a central column, it goes all the way down. Everything's curved. But why do I see edges on the outside? I don't know, I don't know. It's confusing me. Okay, so this all feels curved. And the inside feels curved as well. Um, feels sterile. Sleek. White. 
it all feels fitted. Uh, it doesn't feel awkward, it feels very... Oh, uh, what's the word for this? Encompassing? Everything feels like it has its place. Uh, there are no sharp jutting out edges or anything. There's um, It's like it's been designed with a conservation of space or something. Um, uh, very feng shui kind of in style, kind of sparse, but everything has its place and it's just what's needed. Uh, it has these rings type layers, circular layers inside. There's two or three levels to this that you can go to, maybe through this, this central thing, I don't know, but this, this does feel a bit more solid. This central kind of uh, column within this uh, structure. So it feels very sleek, very lit, um, glowing, white, sterile, and inside there are life. Um, and these life feel different from the outside life. Um, oh, I'm not very good at drawing people. Uh, tall. Um, thin. They feel like they have long blonde hair. I feel opaque, <laughs> opaque or white in skin colour, very fair, fair, fair is the word. Um, there are males and females. Oh, this is strange, but they look alike. They're very similar. It's like the males look quite feminine as well because of their long hair and lips as well. Oh, the lips are, it's not lipstick, pale lips, they have pale lips, striking eyes, um, and they, they move gracefully, um, slowly, um, carefully, uh, their movements are controlled and purposeful, it's like it's like the design of, of the structure, nothing feels wasted. Even their movements, it all feels very controlled, sterile, um, I can't think of the right word for this. Purposeful, yeah, not wasted. They feel very peaceful. At the time of this event, um, the life on the inside are a lot less excited than the life on the outside. Stark contrast really. On the outside it's, it feels like a smaller life form. Four to five feet in height. Skinny, dark hair, dark skin. Simply dressed, very excited by the situation. Um, don't know what to make of it. Kind of thing, whereas the life inside feel very tall, five to seven feet in height, very uh, thin again, um, but whitish, blondish hair, um, blue eyes, uh, fair skin, um, but these feel very relaxed, very calm, very matter of fact, peaceful, non aggressive, not sighted. Yeah, two very stark contrast uh, life forms. They, f they appear to be simply dressed as well. And I want to say it's blue, but is it blue? It feels like a m metallic blue. Sil silver, silver maybe? Silvery blue. And it feels, it's not a uniform. <laughs> it feels like a uniform, but it's not a uniform. In that, I can see two of them side by side, a male and a female. They look very similar, there's not much between them. Um, other than a few details of the face. Um, and body shape, 
which I can tell in the uniform, so the uniform must be tight fitting in places, but not, not all over. Two colors. I want to say gray, stroke silver, and blue. Very elegant. Um, okay, more inside the structure. Inside the structure, I also feel that there are other elements as well. I see, I see like a boxes. Or it feels like arranged. Okay, shape, uh, arranged shapes, and also. Shapes like this, almost like honeycomb shapes. Very angular, very solid, and very boxy. And these feel like containers, and they feel like they're stacked and arranged. Um, like yeah, like honeycomb. And they have these like framed edges to them, and it feels like a like, glass fronted or clear fronted. In some of them, not all of them, in some of them, I can feel and see the. A yellow viscous thick gel like fluid <laughs> and almost like what well, they it looks like a honeycomb with honey in them. That's not honey. It's not not as thick as honey. Or is it? I don't know, it feels denser. And sparkly. So they have these hexagonal cell-like uh, yeah, container structures, but I also feel that I see these boxy shapes, but where's these boxy shapes come in? Because everything else feels quite sleek and fitting and linear, not linear, um, smooth, um, designed. <laughs> if I had to AOL this, I would say it's very Ikea looking. these curved areas as well. Could they? They kind of could they kind of like rise and ramp like so they're like walkways with each with a rising bit to the next to the next level type thing. And that's what it feels like. It feels like you can Walk and spiral your way around the around the, around the structure quite easily in one fluid motion. It feels quite large as well. The structure. And it hums, yeah. It's bright, you know. It glows. The skin, the skin of the structure feels like it's um. Pearlescent, like a pearl, uh, glowing and changing colour and shape. But at the same time, it's kind of like, you know, glowing, bright, throwing off this sound energy. Um, Okay, that's all I'm getting from inside the target structure. Okay, so let's see if we can get anything else on this. Let's try to see if we can try to get some association with some placement of where this is all going on, what's happening here in the general overview type landscape of the area. So we're in target 12C and I'm going to move again from the B position to C, which is going to be 300 feet above to 
see if I can try to get a position off for this. My pen's running out, so let's try a different one here. Okay, 300 feet above. It's a 12 C. Okay. So there's land and it rises. Rises way over here. And there are structures here. Could it be a city? It feels like it's man made structures. There's life. And then there's this thing up here. There's this, this rising kind of event structure type thing. And it's glowing, it's throwing off energy and noise and hum. Feel the hum, feel the hum and energy kind of like. Whew. And the structure, yes, it is above, it's high, it's angular, it's, it's man-made, it's a man-made structure, but it's, it's rising and it's above. Uh, it's all, it's, it's all inspiring. It's, it's above, above the structures, above the people, above the land. What do I see structure-wise? It feels like there's an ornate structure. This feels kind of like curved and angular, but blocky as well. In, dang, in, dang, in, dang. It feels like a, it feels like a structure on the land, uh, ornate, blocky, but also curved, layered. It feels like it's made of the land, stone or something. Um, it feels like it has channels and tunnels and spaces. Underground as well as above ground. So it feels like... It feels like a man-made structure that extends above ground, below ground has, I would say, hidden Hidden areas uh, seem to be spaces underground. And they're carved, carved out of the land. This feels like a structure that's uh, partly carved out of the land or in the land. Within a desolate, rocky, natural, dry environment. Um, with a city in the distance. Oh, I'm getting a conflict here now, because part of me wants to say that the city feels old, or this feels old, or past. But now, on reflection, when I'm thinking about the city here, it feels, could it be built up and modern? Um, with tall structures. I don't know, lit up. At night. Be a night event. I don't know, it's very strange. It feels like I'm looking at two different time zones here or something. Flicking between time zones, past and pre no, not present, but past and past. Um, very strange. Okay, so there is a city, there is a city of man made structures with some kind of Man-made, I say man-made, but structured, ob structured structure is the best way I can put it. Structured structure it feels like it's moving, it feels like it's in the sky or above, rising, or at least rising above the people that are here looking up at it, you know, looking up at it and pointing and saying, wow, look at that, isn't that amazing? But also, also elements of construction and channeled, channeled areas that lead below ground. Um, yeah. 
feels like uh, within the land itself um, or within the structures in the land there are areas that extend below below ground on more than one level and on more than one on, on more than one vertical on more than one horizontal and these feel like large carved hollowed out deep heavy I th they feel heavy because I can feel the the dent the dents kind of weight above me if I'm on one of these areas and it feels cool and carved and, and big it feels like a big carved out space underground yeah in and under the land um, in this big landscape which feels like I can see a vista if I look around me like this I feel like I can see a vista or a horizon um, looking far off into in, into the distance it looks hilly dusty natural dry dusty barren you know uh, an inhospitable not very nice place really other than it does have this this city area there as well and I'm getting a big AOL here so I'm gonna have to write it here an AOL of Las uh, Vegas for some reason um, yeah, well, <laughs> I guess this feels like some kind of uh, Area 51 event. Or something, yeah. Very strange. But it does, yeah, it does have all the horror marks. It does feel like there's some kind of advanced aerial structure that seems to be changing shape or it looks like it's changing shape because it's emitting some kind of energy it seems to be rising it seems to be up above uh, a landscape that has people looking at it they're looking at it in awe of what they're seeing the people looking and interacting with this uh, then go on to try to emulate it in many different forms uh, it feels like it might be to do with 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 their structures or art or or society I don't know I just see that they try to they try to repeat uh, repeat build and emulate uh, what they're seeing from from the, these encounters uh, are they trying to, uh, yeah are they trying to describe it or something uh, So let's summarize this a little bit then for you guys. Okay, so let's start to summer, summarize this target. So let's try to do a summary here. So there's definite energy, motion, interaction. This is rising, it's above. This is structured. I wanna, I don't know, I wanna say diamond shape, but it's not. It's, it's linear, angular, rising in form, outwards. And it's changing shape, it's glowing, it's shiny, it's sharp, it's, it's amazing. The hum coming from it, really intense energy, really intense noise, and it's outwards. It's definitely outwards. It's rising up above the life, you know, a little life here. If I'm the life, the main life at this target, I'm a little life. Looking up at this, in, this, this structure in front of me, looking up in awe and wonderment. And this is just amazing. This is something like I've never seen before. So this is going to change my life forever. I can feel it. There's an instant change in this person, uh, this life. They're so in awe of what they see that 
this vision, this event that's happened in front of them, colors them and changes them forever. And they try to emulate and repeat and to build, build maybe, and to try to understand what they saw and what happened. And I do feel like there's a life, there's life in here as well. In stark contrast to the life that's out here. This life out here feels small, thin, darker, a bit more primitive. There is a life in here, an interaction in here. And these feel taller, lighter, blonder, more advanced, more peaceful. Um, these are these are the ones that are f not forcing an interaction. Or is it forcing, preempting, uh, initiating? So they initiate, initiate an interaction. I feel like there's a meeting that takes place between these smaller dark-haired people and these I want to say tall or blonde haired people yeah, here's the blonde <laughs> not regular this here's the blonde hair kind of you know long blonde hair type thing so there's this, there's some kind of meeting interaction that takes place between these two um, it feels like it's some kind of first time event type, you know, you know, welcome, hi, you know, we're from the new world type meeting. Uh, yeah, almost like two chiefs meeting, you know, interacting, that, that kind of thing. First meeting type thing. So it feels like, a first, it does feel like a first contact type event between an advance and a primitive civilization after uh, an event or witnessing an event of some kind of structured object in the sky above what appears to be a natural but also feels rough, hard, desolate landscape. Slightly hilly in areas leading down to a long vista. Uh, they feel like there's structures here. There's life here but not very much of it. here event past event and it all feels very this all feels very past uh, and it feels like it might it might be on more than one timeline as well I, I get a general feeling of one between one and three events or different situations maybe it's a repeat event that's happened maybe yeah it feels like it feels like some kind of interaction that's happened more than once actually kind of thing for it. Um, yeah. Deep in the past, it feels like it feels like it's deep in the past. And this this structure thing, this structure thing, I see and I keep seeing. It's not hieroglyphics. I'm sure it's not hieroglyphics, but I keep seeing this angular pictographic type carved raised raised and hollowed out surface type writing but it feels like it's in between channels and this feels like it might be on the it feels like it's on the surface of a, of a structure it feels like it has you know it is involved in, in what's happening here I think that's it. I think that's all I'm going to get on this one. The life. If I go, I mean, if I go into the minds of the lives or something, these feel, well, the smaller, darker ones feel all struck. And they, I want, they, they feel primitive, 
I, I don't mean this in a harsh way, I mean as technology wise or something. They feel old, uh, you know, like the basic. Um, but the taller ones they meet feel, definitely feel more advanced, more peaceful. I mean, the, these can be quite, I would say, not warlike, but. Uh, they do have acts of aggression in their past, but these, the, the taller, thinner, blonder ones, uh, I don't know, they, they, feel, they feel more more relaxed, more peaceful, more at peace with who they are, what they are, what they're doing, and they feel like travelers. Uh, they feel like they've traveled, okay, yeah, so they've traveled. They're meeting for the first time. Yeah, okay, I can get in it now. Uh, Peaceful message, they want to impart knowledge, I don't know, it's, it's kind of, it almost feels kind of like a spiritual event. Um, yeah, just like knowledge, um, seeing we're here and this is us, have a look at this, this is what we got, I don't know, it's, um, yeah, a peaceful, Feels like a pe almost like some kind of diplomatic, peaceful first meeting between two leaders of two different societies and tribes, one more advanced than the other, um, which obviously affects the the less advanced one, and do they end up in all of this um, emulating, trying to build uh, and replicate? That's the word, replicate. All that they've experienced, seen and observed. So that's it on this one. I think that's all I'm getting at the moment on, on this Target 12C. Um, very strange one because um, we haven't done a, a UFO structured type target before but this has all the hallmarks of some kind of strange aerial structure that's giving off energy light it's glowing it feels my made and artificial and it feels like yeah it feels like it's in the air above a more primitive life form so it does feel <laughs> it does feel UFO type in, in nature, so it's, it's a very strange target, but it all feels very past as well. Um, high in, yeah, so I, on, on, the, on the surface area and the land and, and the darker, smaller people, it feels very low tech, very, very different from what's, what appears to be inside this um, man-made structure, which feels more high tech, um, complete, completely different. Um, in design, structure, and, and feel. Mm, very interesting. Artificial, artificial, slick, plasticky insides. Very slick, plasticky metal. Very modern, you know, kind of feel. No waste of space, no hard edges, all that kind of stuff. Whereas outside, very harsh, very linear, a very natural, kind of desolate, kind of land type place. Yeah. A contrast, a, a conflict, and a contrast of you know, almost like two different cultures and two different technologies or times or something, you know. Um, yeah, so that's it. Air One. Get a real good visual here of um, like roiling clouds, like the underside of storm clouds. And then there is a uh, like a 
plasma ball glow that I see in the clouds and I see rays of light coming out. So high overcast beams of light uh, coming out of clouds. I'd get um, this target keeps drawing my attention to something um, glowing and that's my first visual of it and I haven't really resolved that out other than to say ionized uh, plasma okay so that's interesting to me that's that's an interesting visual I'm seeing groups of like, I'm seeing groups of people, life forms on the ground. It's nighttime, so the sky is dark. The scene is dark but I see a lot of upturned faces. This that I'm seeing right now, not a lot of people, a couple dozen maybe. There could be 50 people here, but I'm seeing a light reflected off their faces. They're looking up. There's a few more here. They're in the same vicinity, but they seem apart. These seem different. These guys seem different. And up above is this glowing light. Uh, it's indi indistinct to me right now but it's it's putting out a lot of luminosity. This is this is this is bright, and this brightness is illuminating their faces. So these people are looking up at this, and it's a sight to see. They don't seem shocked or aghast. They they seem more like something you'd look at. If you, if any time you see a 747 uh, big jet landing, you're gonna look up and look at it and watch it go by. Even if you've seen it before, it's still of interest. Um, these people don't feel directly contact connected to it. These life forms here seem like they are connected to it, like they um, vectoring, they're vectoring it in. So there's like a schedule. There's a, a time frame, a schedule. They know it's coming. They're part of bringing this in, uh, but they're here, they're down below. And these people aren't it's more unexpected to them. It's, but I, it's something they may have seen before. Um, they don't know the schedule. So they're not completely surprised, but it's like, oh, well, we didn't expect that. But these guys did expect it, and these guys are somehow, I don't want to say responsible, but associated with this waiting for it, um, maybe uh, support crew type of thing. So let's look at, let's look at what this is. It's, it's dark there, but it's illuminated by this object, this glowing uh, plasma thing. 
I'm going to look at the glowing structure slash object that I see up here. Okay, this is the clearest visual that I get on this target. Uh, I can pretty much call this up. Let's see if I can draw it. This seems metallic, but this is the bright part. I keep seeing these dividing like panels. And behind that is This light is yellower than this. This is orange is the closest pen I have. I can draw this um, better in Photoshop later. So, but what I'm seeing is bottom. Isn't that rounded on the bottom? Okay, so that's the glow. That's the luminescent glow that's drawing my attention. And this is above, what's above the horizon? There's structures down here, more structures on this side. There's, the people are looking up, the beings are looking up here. And I, at one point, see something like extending down here I don't want to say tether line um, beam um, I don't know what it is it, it may not be physical it may be a energy beam but it somehow uh, the concept of tether, but not a physical tether, something that is connects um, some sounds, crackle, buzz, hum, um, charged, um, static, <laughs> electrical sounds, sounds of uh, something that's pretty charged. And speaking of pretty charged, there's um, uh, ionization, like ionized, ionized plasma gases. This is, this thing is, uh, Super dynamic, supercharged, super. Um, it's it's got a lot of uh, electrical, gravitational, ionized plasma. There's just 
a lot of uh, a lot of charge to, th to this is the best way I can say it. a lot of a lot of charge um, so that's the glowing thing I should See if I can look inside. I'll do a movement order. Really is pretty cool to see up there. Okay. Move inside. This will take me a minute. Okay, this is a movement order. Move inside this structure. engine compartment in a nuclear submarine. Let me see if I can draw this. If it's got a kind of a dome shape like this, and we would be like something here. And inside is Some of this is metallic, like really dense, high-tech metal tubing, piping. Um, and some of it is uh, various metals in um, various states, like metal that's a gas. Um, what do I want to say? Like charged um, particles with a... And then there's a, like a cone thing. And a, a jacket around this. I sense that that would be power tubing. A lot of a electrical fiber optic, a lot of interconnected stuff, but there's, there's rotating, rotating charged gases, ionized charged But it's not, um, plasma charged particles rotating in, there's little places where they, highly, um, the super collider, don't they shoot one particle at each other down the super collider? This is like the super collider, but there's not one particle. There's billion, I mean, there's, it's full of particles. Um, I don't understand this. Um, so then the part below I don't get a sense that you would have life here. You wouldn't want to be here. Like you wouldn't want to be in the reactor compartment of a 
of a nuclear submarine or aircraft carrier, they'd have to bring it down to a like unscram. This isn't nuclear, but you wouldn't want this going so. This below here would be where the people or the beans would be. And all around this is plasma. Um, wow. Um, magnetic fields. So this is something to do with uh, uh, the MRI machine from a thousand on steroids, like heavy, heavy magnetic fields in here. The power is, the power cell is here and it's small. It's not, this isn't generating power. This is, it takes power to run it a lot but there's a lot of power in a small, clean, there's no fuel. It pulls energy out of thin air. No, out of the, uh, there's just energy in the dimension that they take it out of. Okay, let's see if we can see some people being subjects, life forms. Life one. What I'm seeing here is a screen that is, I see a glow from it. It's kind of a, it's indistinct, but it's a, it's a screen and it's, it's on, it's active. And I see a tall, So this is kind of dim to me because the light's coming off the screen and it's not real bright in here. Kind of shadowy to me. This one is taller. These one are sh shorter. There's a bunch of them. I would have to say, um, I get a sense of, like almost father figure, leader, um, definitely smarter. Um, like these are helpers. Um, they're not kids, but they look like kids. Like uh, the, some dwarfs are helping them or something. Let me look at him. And, uh,
not really an artist. This is challenging to draw on the spot what I just see for a, a flash. Um, I get a definite male uh, energy. Um, feels male, but Very handsome, a very pretty man, like a a, uh, a Swedish actor. Kind of looks like Julian Assange. This has nothing to do with Julian Assange or WikiLeaks, but has it kind of look like smooth, perfect skin? I get real a real masculine manly feel but not not like doesn't need a shave like smooth skin masculine but handsome to the point of being pretty but not at all effeminate um hair is kind of swept back and long light brown blondish hair um clothes are comfortable, very fine fabric, really nice fabric, um, not cashmere, but like cashmere, not silk, but like silk, not, may not even be from an animal source. The, the clothes are uh, just finely, finely made now. This is really weird, but this guy can look like this. And he's quite tall. Quite tall. Um, just a nice looking guy. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I would say like beige color clothes um, very statuesque very self-assured very smart um, I want to say almost godlike intelligence uh, knowledge of physics mathematics uh, natural sciences um, genetics uh, this guy would have 10 PhDs, really, really smart. If you could, maybe I could, I'll try it. Um, there's something. I'm drawn to his eyes. When I look into his eyes, I see something else. And really friendly face, but looking in the eyes, okay, he can like morph, like change. And I'm going to draw that. Let's see if I can. Um, no, no, no. Um, almost chubbier here. Yeah, chubbier cheeks. Forehead, not the big. He looks like a cat. I uh, 
I want to draw ears like cat ears, but I don't think he's got cat ears. I, I, because his eyes look so much like a cat. I want to draw whiskers, but there's, I don't think there's whiskers. Um, it's cat eyes. He can look like a, a cat man. He can change his appearance. I think. Um, so, Mr. Catman, tell me something about your science. The, the stars on the velvet, the light doesn't come through the velvet. The earth isn't flat, okay. He's saying the earth isn't flat when we know that. But they did used to think the earth was flat. They were wrong. That was the science at the time. And the universe isn't three-dimensional. So if you thinking the universe is three-dimensional is like thinking the earth is flat. And he can illustrate this for me by saying the light doesn't reside on the velvet. If I took a piece of black cloth and, okay, so this is all black and there were holes in it You poked holes in the black velvet and you put it up in front of a light source here. The light will shine through the holes so it looks to you in two dimensions like there are points of light on this black cloth. If I hold up a paper and I put holes in it, it would, it is black, it looked like the lights are in the uh, dimension of the paper, but it's hard to explain. The light is really something else from another dimension coming through. So, if you look at the stars in the night sky in the universe, they look like points of light embedded in this 3D reality, we were told that it's um, um, gases and gases, dust, interstellar dust collapses um, of its own gravity and ignites and turns into a star. And he's saying that isn't how it works. That the stars are like um, holes to another dimension. And if you use it as a one dimensional thing, like a piece of velvet, I mean, the stars are there's one here, 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 and there's one here. And what they are is um, energy coming through from a f like a fourth dimension. So they're holes to another dimension. They're not just a, a nuclear um, fusion reaction going on. They're uh, a hole in the third dimension that goes to another dimension. And I was working part of this session and I got a charged energy and then charged energy 
and a, a rapid transfer back and forth. Um, I think it relates in that what he, he's explaining is that the like the stars connect to another dimension and if you go to that dimension that exists in one place but the stars in this seeming three dimension it seems like they're far apart but if you can go through to that you can go out any other one and that's how they travel did that make sense so um, Interdimensional travel faster than light. <sighs> well, that was the remote viewing part of this presentation. And what do you think? I personally believe that both myself and Dick Algar recorded valid and accurate information for what we do know about this target. For the parts we don't know, I also believe and hope that the valid information will be confirmed by one of the key participants in this main Phoenix event and others, and that's Dr. Lin, and she's coming up next. Uh, you know, and I'm really honest, I want to thank you for taking the time to meet with me. I know you're very busy and I've, I've been a great fan and, and consumer of, of your experiences in your work and everything you've done on the Phoenix Lights way back in, in since I first heard about them in UFO magazine here in the UK in, in, in the late 90s myself. So wow. I've been a huge follower of, of the the event itself um, before I even found remote viewing and before I did the target for the Farsight Institute. Um, I read several books on 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 the, the lights and I've seen loads of articles. You know, back then in the late 90s, there wasn't a lot of internet around so there wasn't a lot on the internet like there is nowadays so uh, you know i consumed as much as i did and i just want to say it's an honor to talk to you you know uh, it, the the experiences and the work and and the amount of years you've put into promoting and informing people about this case is you know it's beyond what anyone else has ever done so, so thank you for that well, I really appreciate that you appreciate it because I appreciate you as well. And, um, you know, I applaud you for doing what you do and being interested in this in this topic and uh, the case itself and very impressive remote viewing, I must say, um, that I hope that your viewers out there will take a look at and um Absolutely. you know that so much was right on target that it was like whoa i got chilled <laughs> but, excellent and it's great to do this collaboration because what i want to do is um by adding some of your you know your information to the front of the of the remote viewing data i want to hopefully reach you know because we have thousands of, of subscribers and i want to you know some of those are, are younger people and that and they might not have heard about the case so i want to show them what happened you know and show them that all this information is out there that they can they can explore because it's you know it's the biggest most witnessed ufo event in in modern history um so, for sure yeah, yeah and, and there is so much more to this story. That was one of the reasons after seven years of anonymity, after the mass sighting, I did not want to come forward. I mean, that was the last thing I wanted to do. And yet, both my husband, who corroborates, and myself, both healthy skeptics were physicians, okay? We must be open uh, to whatever comes through the door there. Um, saw something so spectacular and unusual right outside our bedroom window. We live mountainside in Paradise Valley, it's called, but it's right on the edge of Scottsdale and Phoenix, uh, very high on the mountain. 
looking down on the valley. They call it the Valley of the Sun. And we're surrounded by mountain ranges. So our view, and if anybody's out there that can get on the internet, on the Phoenix Lights Network website, go to the photo page. The first picture is a topography from our view. And our view is a panoramic view, not only of the city skyline, but of the airport that's right in front of South Mountain. And a few miles back, are the Estrella Mountain Range, which come into the picture here, um, which I'll also share. But, um, you know, we see planes and helicopters and streetlights and car lights. We're very familiar with all that. And two years before the mass sighting, without any interest or knowledge, both of us, no interest or knowledge in this topic at all, witnessed right outside our bedroom window. And there's a lot of coincidences. It actually was the eve of my birthday, if you call that a little coincidence, because it was an amazing gift from beyond, I have to say, which changed my life forever, um, were three amber orbs in a pyramid formation, one on top and two very closely aligned underneath. And my husband actually called me out of a bath in the adjacent room. I was leisurely taking a bath and he was on the phone with my mother-in-law from back east. Uh, we were born and raised in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, to wish me a happy birthday. And nothing ever ruffled his feathers. He was on several state and hospital medical boards and so forth. He sounded alarmed. He says, oh my God, what is that? Get over here quick. I grabbed my towel, wringing wet, and standing there, looking a little below us, because we're really high on the mountain, and we're kind of nestled in a mountain range, and it's gated. There is no way, and I underline that a zillion times, that it was military. Because why would they be right outside our bedroom window in a private, gated, nestled in the mountains community that's a no-fly zone, by the way, yeah. um, but a little below us over very treacherous desert landscape. And I looked underneath to see if anybody was there, which they shouldn't have been because it's gated, and it was pitch black. And about 50, 75 feet off the desert floor were these three amber orbs, and I immediately... But, oh, my goodness, I've got to run and get my camera. But and I'm sure there's some people out there that, that understand this. You don't know how long it's going to last. <laughs> so yeah. I didn't want to miss anything. <laughs> so I try to take everything in mentally. And I always go back to this sighting because I really took it in mentally. Um, the orbs and I call them an orb because the light did not go outside the edge. If you look at the first picture on the Phoenix Lights Network photo page, You'll see the topography and there's a car coming down the road and those lights reflect onto the road, okay? Every other light out there glared. These did not, they were self-contained. They were about, I guess, three to six feet each, depending on how close they were. Yeah. And they were pretty close. Uh, they color within each orb with a uniform amber color throughout and it didn't glare at all. I mean, that's what got me. Every, every other light out there glared. It was very mesmerizing, very soothing. Um, I, I was just in awe. And I thought, if I don't get a picture of this, no one's going to believe it. <laughs> like I go running to the closet to grab my 35 millimeters. I keep handy for the beautiful sunsets we have here. And actually on the photo page, if you go down to the bottom, which is another little interesting aside, you'll see November and December of 2000, I took about five rolls of film with the holidays and so forth. I got them back and in the 35 millimeter, that's what's so significant. They're in the negative. They can't be fudged. They can't be changed. They're in the negative. All my pictures are 35 millimeter. There's a massive rod shaped object in the same exact spot a month apart that I did not see when I was taking the pictures but they're in the negative, okay? So you can take a peek at that and the sun, sunsets are really pretty. But anyway, I go run to the closet to grab my very cheap Canon Instamatic camera that I use. And my husband calls me back. He get, says, get over here quick. One of them is disappearing. As we watched, the top orb started to shrink very, very slowly, mechanically, as if there was an intelligent presence behind it. Uh, it's it's difficult to even describe in, in logical terms, like a like a dimmer switch almost. But nonetheless, it was getting smaller, slowly, smaller and smaller until it was pea size and then disappeared. But it felt like it was still there. Where did it go? Okay. I jump out on the balcony, which is a, a door, a sliding glass door perpendicular to this big picture window that we're looking out of, one wall 
oh, our bedroom was this window. And anything that popped up out there, we, we saw, including these. And I jump out on the balcony, take a quick shot of the two lower orbs. And that shot is on the website, so you can look at it. And immediately noticed an eerie silence, as if time had stopped. It was just bizarre. And as intently as I was staring at these two lower orbs, and I did not share this with the soul <laughs> until two years later after the mass sighting, it felt like something was watching me. And going through my mind, I was thinking, who are you? What are you? Do you know that I'm here? I'd love to meet you, right? The next thing I remember, the left bottom orb started to shrink, just like the top one did. And something told me to take a picture, and I quickly shot a picture of that. That's there, too. That's all I remember. <laughs> I don't remember going inside. I don't remember uh, taking, you know, watching the, the the last one disappear. I just don't remember. That was it. But there was something about that sighting that not only was it awesome and mesmerizing and mind-boggling, to, to experience that, but it changed my life because I started to wonder, what was that? What was, I didn't know anything about this. And, and what was it doing right outside our bedroom window? And why did my husband and I see it together? And all these thoughts. And for two years, um, yes, I admit, I did look out to the sky to see if it would return again. Nothing, nothing even remotely similar to these orbs until, and this is really significant data, two months before the mass sighting, yeah. I'm lying in bed. And again, one wall of our bedroom is a window. So whatever pops up out there, we, we see whether it's a, a yeah. fire somewhere or a haboob, they call it, these dust storms that come through. I noticed three huge amber balls at a distance far west in an equidistant line. And I'm watching them and I'm thinking, wait a minute, they're amber, they're in a formation, they're hovering for minutes, even though they're at a distance, they're huge, strangely similar to 95. And I watched each one as they looked like they were imploding, like shrinking again from right to left, they were gone. I mentioned it to my husband. Interestingly, after that close sighting, he would not talk about it. He would get agitated when I brought it up. You know, everybody comes from a different background, different yeah. upbringing, different belief system, different worldview. Some people can't deal with this topic. Some people don't want to, and that's okay. Everyone in their own time. But I mentioned it to him and he said, do I still have to go to work tomorrow? That was his <laughs> reaction. So the next night, actually, he was at a medical board meeting and I come upstairs and I noticed about eight o'clock, the same three orbs in a row, equidistant from each other, are now far south near the airport. And I thought, whoa, I've got to, you know, get my video camera and get a picture. So I run downstairs, get my video camera, and it was charged. I go out to the front of the house. I get about 18 seconds worth. The battery goes dead. I go inside, hook up the battery, go outside, they're gone. About a half hour later, my husband's coming up our driveway and we're really high up on the mountain. And I go outside and I thought, I said to him, you know, honey, remember the three orbs that were in an equidistant row last night that I told you about far west? About a half an hour ago, they were right in front of South Mountain. As I'm pointing like this, they reappear in the same spot. And it was like, whoa, whoa, I've got to get my camera. Now, again, a little coincidence because in video, it doesn't do the lights justice. Anybody that's seen the handful of videos, that's all there, there is really out there till now, 20, you know, 26 years later, yep. we'll see that they're much smaller, they're white, they flicker. Nonetheless, the formations are very compelling if you really look at them. But yep. 35 yep. millimeter, they're in the negative. So I run upstairs, I grab my 35 millimeter. As I'm ready to shoot the three bottom orbs, suddenly six orbs pop up above the three it was unnerving not having an explanation for 95 close sighting it was like whoa you know is this a mothership or a fleet that's what popped in my head yeah. and i was shaking and you can see from the first picture it's wavy because i was shaking but thank goodness i kept my wits about me and i kept clicking away the second picture to me is a smoking gun because if you look at that picture, it looks like a V, like one in the center with two on each side and two underneath. Two months later, 
March 13th, 1997, when thousands of people were outside looking up at the sky at the Hale-Bopp Comet, and they also caught a glimpse of these phenomena, which I'll get into because there was multiple things happening. Yep. Many people said that what they saw during the mass sighting two months later were five lights in a V formation with two trailing lights. Okay, and here it is right there two months before. As I continued, it looked like this, whatever it was, turned, okay, from head on and turned into a V. Well, to make a very long story short, it was so unnerving. The next morning, I figured, look, there must be a logical explanation. And I started calling around. Yeah. Uh, Luke Air Force Base just blew me off, okay, and referred me to the airport because they said I mentioned that it was near the airport. Finally got the FAA on the phone. Finally got air traffic controllers. There was a group of air traffic controllers that saw the same thing that I was filming at the same time over, and they were very forthcoming initially, over Class B restricted airspace. There's a 30 mile radius around the center of the airport. Anything that comes into that airspace, particularly this, that was like five miles away at a thousand feet altitude must call into the tower and no one did. And the fellow that got on the phone was a meteorologist and he was more excited than I was, I have to tell you, that, that I saw what they saw too. At eight o'clock, they saw the three and then looked on radar, did not show up on radar, and they got alarmed because here was something right in the airspace, right near planes taking off and coming into Sky Harbor. They disappeared. At 8.30, when the six popped up, they got really nervous, looked on radar, didn't show up on radar, took their high-powered binoculars to look. And in their own words, there were six points of light, totally equidistant from each other, massive span over a mile wide, a thousand feet altitude that seemed to be attached to something. But they couldn't quite see what these lights were attached to or had a force field holding them in rock solid formation. And again, this one of the fellows was a, a meteorologist and he chimed in and said, the entire thing turned as a unit against the wind and then elevated slowly and in synchrony moved behind South Mountain, which was right just behind the airport. Yep. So I said, so what was it? And there was silence. And then he says, beats me. I said, you're an air traffic controller. You're supposed to know it's in our airspace. He said that the whole group, and there was a, a, a group that saw this, ruled out every conventional aircraft, balloons, Chinese lanterns, flares, even skydivers with lights. Um, they couldn't come up with anything that was logical that it could have been. We kept in contact up until and including March 13th, 1997. Want me to get into that, or do you have any questions so far? Yeah, no. I, I mean, I just have a comment on what you've seen, what you've talked about so far, um, because m people that may may not have done a deep dive into this event might not have known that there was, you know, events up to two, at least two years bef before the, what we call the, the main event, um, and the size that you're reporting, and you know what they saw is just is when unless you get to see it, I guess seeing something that you know, could be a mile in size, it's just it's just too hard to comprehend in your in your in your own mind about what kind of technology that would take for something like that to be in the air, really. Absolutely, and the fact that air traffic controllers were just blown away, and yeah. they had no idea what it was. And we're talking over air traffic. <laughs> yeah. People, you know, pilots were calling in, and we'll get to that too on the during the mass sighting um, when thousands of people were outside looking up at the sky at the Hale-Bopp Comet, which is another little coincidence, okay, which really isn't because there's history to this. Um, actually, uh, in Mexico in 1991, there was an eclipse and thousands of people were outside looking up at the sky and lo and behold, there's UFOs all over the place. So it seems like whoever did this wanted to be seen. Yes. Um, and we'll get into that further if you like. But uh, here, thousands of people are outside on a very beautiful, clear night, looking up at the sky. And besides the help up comet, now this is where it really gets interesting. And one of the reasons I had to come forward because there is so much mis and disinformation out there that it's so frustrating <laughs> that people don't know. Not only, like you mentioned, that it, you know, there was stuff happening before, and we're not just talking about two months and two years before, and I'll get to that in a minute. But and we're talking about centuries before, actually, according to the native cultures right here in Arizona. Yeah. But um, here they saw one, two, eight mile wide 
According to Peter Davenport, the director of the National UFO Reporting Center, from all his data that he's received for years from hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of people and drawings and so forth, either of these orbs, as the air traffic controller said, that seemed to be attached to something, but they couldn't quite see what it was attached to. You even mentioned in your remote viewing that it was like sparkly, and some people say it looked, looked like it was looking through water, um, and I blocked out the stars. Other people, many other people, actually saw craft, actual craft with gunmetal bottoms, with um, we even have a pilot in our documentary who was right under this uh, object, and he was looking what he called a canister of spinning energy, okay, one of, one of the lights. Um, some people saw these lights detach from the main object, go out into the environment, and then redock with it later. Uh, I've been asked, is that what happened in 95? Because if you go back to the 95 pictures, and we can go back to that if you like now or, or later, because there's much more to the story than the 95 pictures. But if you go back to those pictures and just look, I mean, this is in the negative, okay? Yeah. They're there. Yeah. The same exact phenomenon is in the same exact location as two months before the mass sighting and during the mass sighting in 95. They're there disappearing while we're watching the close orbs disappear. And uh, uh, if you'd like, and I hope we have time to get back to, to how that was analyzed by Navy optical physicist, Dr. Bruce McAbee, because he came up with an incredible riveting conclusion from my pictures uh, from 95. But to get back to the mass sighting, these things were rooftop level, these craft, actual craft, again, some people saw gunmetal. Some people, you mentioned some kind of a, um, a pattern. Some people saw a pattern yeah. underneath, actually. And um, go right over their heads, rooftop level, like 30 miles an hour, totally silent. There were very few people that said they heard a little hum, but there were, there were some. But most people said it was totally silent. And then some people saw it take off at blink speed without even dispersing the air or a sonic boom. Um, if you go to the GAP page, G-A-P, Geospatial Animation Project at the Phoenix Lights Network website, a 12-year study by the investigators here of hundreds of reports and two or more people they really tried to be as scientific as possible. And we're doing a scientific uh, survey study now on how the Phoenix Lights affected people in real time and long term, which is also on the website at the um, uh, landing page underneath the triangle for anybody that's seen something similar. And people have worldwide, I have to say. that's It's very exciting um, and it's affected them. I mean, the results are incredible, um, which will be forthcoming. But at any rate, um, if you go to the gap page, two or more people had to see the same craft to be in the study. And after 12 years, it was concluded that there were 10 different craft. And if you look at the pictures, the illustrations, they're different, okay? Whether it was one craft that could morph, okay? Yep. And it was mentioned that it seemed like it was changing. I think you mentioned that yep. it looked like it was changing or the perspective from where the person was standing, or a parade. And that's where it really gets interesting because the media picked up right away on the eight to 10 time period, 8 p.m. to 10 p.m., when most people were outside looking up at the hale Bob Comet. And when they saw these unusual, massive objects, they started making their calls and they just honed in right on that. Yeah. The truth of it is, that the mass sighting on March 13th, 1997, actually began at 3 p.m. in the afternoon, daylight sightings in Arizona. Five o'clock hour, Native Americans were seeing them in New Mexico. Seven o'clock hour and beyond in California. The 10, 11 o'clock hour, there were two commercial airline pilots that actually saw, they reported, and it took years for one of the pilots to contact me to describe the whole thing that happened with her. It's really interesting that one of these massive craft was covering Las Vegas. OK, and the, the sightings continued and very credible people saw them after yes. midnight at 3 a.m. There was a call from 
an alleged crewman from Luke Air Force Base to the National UFO Reporting Center, Peter Davenport, and he recorded it. It's very professional, very detailed. Part of that recording is in our documentary, and I talk about it in the book as well, reporting that jets were sent off from Luke Air Force Base to intercept one of these over-mile-wide craft hovering right over central Phoenix. 7th Avenue and Indian School, right in central Phoenix. And there are civilians that actually saw this happening. And as they approached, the lights dimmed, and then the entire thing blinked out and disappeared. Mm -hmm. And he said that he helped one of the pilots out of his craft because he was so shaken up by it. And Luke Air Force Base went on lockdown after that. And I have confirmation of that as well from the weather person who contacted me just this past year after so many years oh to God. reveal yeah. that they were getting many, many calls and they denied they were getting calls. And yet there were people saying that they got the number of the National UFO Reporting Center from Luke Air Force Base. So there's a, a lot going on here. Adding the sightings continued until 5.30 the next morning when a Boeing crew was coming into the Sky Harbor International Airport. I met with the head of that Boeing crew who described one of these craft covering right over their tarmac. So we're talking about over a dozen hours, yeah. four states, yeah. okay? We're talking not only Arizona, but New Mexico, California, Nevada, uh, I mean, and, and I've gotten reports from Texas as well um, and Utah. So I mean, we're talking a parade. OK, mm -hmm. so that was March 13th, 1997. And we're talking between 10 and, and 20,000 people saw this happening. And yet, interestingly, and I'm just going to tell you the tip of the iceberg, uh, how the story un unfolded, if you'd like to hear it at this Absolutely. point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there was no investigation. Supposedly, there was no explanation from government or military. It was uncanny. I mean, because we're talking that if this went right over people's heads. Some people said it was so close they could have thrown a rock at it. We have a, a new witness that just came forward a couple of years ago. Uh, if anybody can watch UFO Witness, episode five, uh, I had asked him to please share it. And in that uh, episode, he's an RN. Yep. It was right underneath one of these craft. And he said when he looked up into this well of energy or, or he said it looked like lava that was coming down. He thought it was going to hit him. <laughs> he was going to get burned. But before it came out, it shot up again and then it started coming down again. OK, that was his description. I mean, the descriptions from people up close, you know, like I said, some people said they could have thrown a rock at it. It was that close. And yet there was nothing for months. Finally, in, in uh, May, okay, and we're talking March 13th to May, a councilwoman had gotten so many calls from a constituent, she didn't see it. She was just doing her job and asked innocently, a councilwoman, and she was also vice mayor of Phoenix, uh, asked innocently in a council meeting, you know, maybe we should investigate this. I'm getting so many calls. And she was plastered. The, the ridicule and stickering and discrediting was rampant. In 97, I was so happy to keep it out of this. I didn't I didn't know what I was going to do with what I had. And I didn't know anything about this. So certainly I had to educate myself first and, and do the homework because, hey, I don't know what it is. Right. So at any rate, um, she uh, the, the cartoons and the and the ridicule. I mean, it was just awful for anybody that came forward. Yeah. And yet. June 18th. Front page, USA Today article. Finally, people outside of Arizona were hearing about our mass sighting for the very first time. And we didn't have social media then. And yet it went viral overnight. Every national morning show, Dan Rather, Peter Jennings, um, we were deluged by media from all over the world. And once they started talking to the witnesses, their descriptions were so heartfelt and so detailed that they too were asking, why isn't there an investigation? Why isn't there an explanation? After nothing for months, the very next day, June 19th, suddenly we get an announcement publicly on the radio, on TV, that the former governor, Vice Symington, Arizona governor, was calling an unscheduled press conference for that afternoon to reveal the culprit of the lights over Phoenix. And I, frankly, I was thrilled. I was looking for any logical explanation. Here he comes 
marching out one of his aides with a giant alien head costume and made a mockery of it. And for those that saw it and experienced the Phoenix Light, it was not a joke, including myself. Okay. <laughs> and that put a lid on things, I have to tell you, for a little bit. That next month, I called every military base to find out what they knew and if I could get any kind of an answer at all, because it just didn't make sense. I mean, come on. Uh, not only did I see what I saw, but you know, now I'm hearing from people that they had this craft right above them, right? Yeah. And they were more interested in meeting with me and seeing the documentation I had, photographic documentation, than giving an answer. They were just as curious. In fact, one, one of them, one of the higher ups, I tried to get as high up as I could, said, uh, oh, the only ones that know who did this were whoever did it in God. That's an answer, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, so, you know, that a month passed and I got a call. And this, this really is intriguing. On July 24th, from one of the heads of PR at the Air National Guard, and she says, oh, Dr. Lynn, I think we know what those lights were back in March. And I was thrilled. I wanted to know, okay, what were they? Yeah. She says, do you believe in all these months, no one ever looked at the log for visiting Air National Guard and the Maryland Air National Guard was in town sending off military illumination flares. And that must be what some people saw. So I said, no, wait a minute. When was the Air National Guard in town? The Maryland Air National Guard. She said, March 1st to the 15th. I said, were they in town in January? She said, oh no. I said, are you sure? She said, absolutely not. I said, well, I said, my husband and I both saw and photographed the same exact phenomena in the same exact location confirmed the next morning in January and the morning after the mass sighting because I called them up again and I said, this looks so similar. And they said, yes, it was the same exact thing in the same exact spot. And, and a couple pilots called in, which we'll get to. A commercial pilot on departure said, what the hell are these lights over me? And a private pilot who I will divulge who that was a little later because he did not come forward till 2017 mm -hmm. on approach close approach also reported exactly what i was filming at the same time which is pretty cool but yeah. nonetheless um so she says you never told me that <laughs> i saw those two months before i said besides and and by then i had educated myself to anything logical including flares okay um because like i said in video they could be mistaken for flares because they're white and they flicker and whatever, and they're small. I said, flares that are dropped from an aircraft on a, with a parachute have drift haphazardly to the ground, okay? Have huge smoke trails that are illuminated by the flare itself and are meant to illuminate the area around it so that missiles will seek them instead of the aircraft, right? Yeah. Um, Traverse the entire state in a rock solid, equidistantly spaced, mile wide V formation for hours. And she says, uh, I have a call coming in, I'll get back to you. Well, I'm still waiting to say <laughs> six years later. <laughs> but nonetheless, I mean, here we're talking about something that was so spectacular. And it wasn't until right after the 10th anniversary, and I'm leaving a lot out here, but uh, as the story unfolded, right after the 10th anniversary, the former Governor Symington finally came forward. And his UK interview is actually on the news page on the Phoenix Lights Network website, if anybody cares to, to take a look at it. It is enlightening because he was a, um, a, a awarded military pilot and he divulged that he actually saw one of these mile wide craft himself <laughs> and that it was definitely not flares. Mm -hmm. And also in his own words, which is interesting because by then I also learned that other countries are much more open to these phenomena as being what he called otherworldly. He used that same word. And you know, there's a vast history if we have time to get into this, but other countries, Belgium, UK, um, uh, Russia, I mean, they, they, these sightings have been happening for many, many moons. If I can, get, you know, and right after the 2017, okay, um, just to close close this out, which, which is pretty significant, the private pilot finally came forward and it was none other than actor Kurt Russell. 
who was on approach to Sky Harbor with his son, who saw it first. And it's interesting. And he was a young adult at the time. But kids were the first to usually see this, this V. OK, and we're so inundated with uh, inundated with threat, threat, threat and harm, harm, harm from Hollywood and the media that the movie Independence Day was huge about six months before. And they were up, you know, jumping up and down Independence Day, Independence Day is this mile wide view of lights was coming towards them. And yet and this is a very, very important part of this whole picture. A calmness came over everyone adults and children alike, as the optic came closer. And as it departed, they wanted to run after it. They wanted their parents to get in the car and, and, and seek it. And that's what we're studying now. And, and it's riveting findings that we're getting from how these phenomena affected people at a very, very deep level in real time and a long term. Because people after the mass sighting who were witnesses actually not only were changed forever. I mean, they they woke up, okay, that, that we're not alone in the universe. It was that real to them. And it doesn't happen. That doesn't happen with flares or balloons or, you know, helicopters or whatever. Um, also, some people stopped eating meat. Some people went into the peace movement. Some people went into the environmental movement. It just woke people up to how important it is that we are stewards of our planet. Uh, astronaut Edgar Mitchell, uh, Dr. Edgar Mitchell, who's in our documentary, he's wonderful, and he talks about this. Uh, and, and it really woke people up. It changed people forever, and we're finding that and confirming it. That's why I'm doing this scientific study, to really confirm if it's true that, that these phenomena, which are worldwide, I mean, we have people, we have over 500 people who have participated already just in a few months. And I welcome anyone there that would like to participate as well. Um, it's a very short questionnaire, totally anonymous, totally confidential. We want people to be honest. And what's coming back to us is mind boggling to be <laughs> truthful. Um, but I, if, if I can, there were a couple of little coincidences that are really cool. I think your audience yeah, might, yeah. might yeah. enjoy. And it's something that maybe you want to look into as well, because... Six months before the mass sighting, I, I have dedicated my life's work. And that's the other thing that's ironic, because eventually, after thousands of people saw what I had seen, and I start, I pushed my whole medical career aside for seven years. This is not about me. OK, it's about the data. And I wanted to find a logical explanation. I kept looking and looking and I kept writing and writing and ended up with a 750 page journal seven years later. It was such incredibly credible data that I compiled about the history of these phenomena, about the connection um, that, that we all have, which I hope we have time to get into, which is another interesting aside. Um, but six months before the mass sighting, because I formed a company in 85 to produce video and workbook curriculums on vital health issues. I saw the need in the classroom to wake kids up to uh, drug abuse, to teen pregnancy, to AIDS and so forth. Um, and they won all kinds of awards and Discovery Education uh, distributed them for many, many years. Um, at any rate, I was invited to present my substance abuse program at the Gila Bend, G-I-L-A, Gila Bend Indian Reservation, which is actually situated, and if you look at that first picture on the Phoenix Lights Network website photo page, you can see South Mountain, and then a few miles back is, is the Estrella Mountain Range. And in between is very sacred ground, the Hill of Bend Indian Reservation. And they have one school. And they don't talk to outsiders, but I helped out the principal. And I noticed, and again, I try to deal with the data. The data speaks for itself. <laughs> um, and I, I called up the principal and I said, you know, I'm looking at these pictures that I have, and it seems that these phenomena keep popping up right where South Mountain and the Australia Mountains intersect. And you're right in that area. Did anybody see some strange lights on March 13th? And he started to giggle. And I said, is that funny? And he said, are you kidding? We've been looking up at them for centuries. We call them sky people, light beings. I had no idea. That was the first I ever heard of it. And he says to me that that's how the Australia's got its name. It means star. In Spanish, gateway to the stars. There, it's the lore and the and the petroglyphs drawings etched out, centuries old petroglyphs. There's one that's exactly what my husband and I saw: the three orbs of the triangle formation. And he said that they believe that there is a gateway or a portal in that area. That would be an interesting thing for you to to try to investigate. Yeah. Um, 
And that really blew me away. And that the Hopi right here in Arizona have protocols. They welcome these phenomena. They um, are comfortable. In fact, the day before our man sighting up in the Navajo Nation, and, I, and now I work with Navajo Rangers who shared this with me, the day before they had a big sighting on their Navajo Nation, they see these things all the time. And they see these giant rod-shaped motherships with orbs coming out or this coming out. And there were these orbs the day before for over an hour, just going around in circles and then go in the other direction. And the whole town, Loop it's called, um, that came out with their lawn chairs and watched them for an hour. To them, it's just natural. They welcome, they welcome them. And uh, some believe, some native cultures believe that these orbs are actually spirit world or ancestors coming to give them knowledge and comfort and uh, inspiration. And I have to admit that as, for whatever reason, because I would have never, ever chosen this topic, especially to go public, okay? I have been inspired beyond belief to not only collect the data and, you know, I'm just bringing, again, it's not about me. I'm just bringing my expertise to help to collect the data in a, in a very scientific, credible way, as much as possible and prosaic way, and just get it out there yeah. and let people decide for themselves. And I, another little interesting aside, and, and then maybe we can get into how it really affected people. Um, a week before the mass sighting, it was ridiculous. My husband was getting a little annoyed with me running out and taking pictures of these things <laughs> constantly. Every time I saw them, I had a document from the scientists in me. And I thought, okay, I, I've got, there must be a logical explanation. And I finally started showing the video to some of my friends. And I said, does anybody know anybody I can show this to? And this is how close I was. A friend of a friend had a neighbor who had a friend who knew the past president of MUFON, Mutual UFO Network, which I had never heard of before. Refers me, I get, I get to call the past president and I tell him, look, I've been seeing these orbs. He hadn't heard about it, but there were other people that were seeing them along with me and photographing them. In fact, one of them hauled MUFON up to their balcony the night of the mass sighting, and they caught a video of like a like an arrowhead of five lights. Those lights are either, I mean, they're rock solid, either attached to something or a force field in between holding them in rock solid formation. And I said, besides that, I have a picture, and the only one that turned out at the time from 95 was the last picture there. And I said, I'd love for somebody to tell me what it is. So he refers me to a field investigator for the following Wednesday, who calls me on Tuesday to say that the then state director wanted to be there at the meeting, but his mom had passed on Saturday. The funeral was Wednesday. Could we postpone? The only window of opportunity I had for two, three weeks after it was Friday morning at 10 o'clock. He said, fine. I knock on his door. He opens the door. The first thing he says to me is, did you see the mass sighting last night? And I said, well, I saw something very similar to what I told you that I saw two months ago and, and photographed. In fact, I called the air traffic controllers this morning and they shared that it was the same exact phenomena as two months ago in the same exact location over Class B restricted airspace, a thousand feet altitude. And then a couple of pilots called in and I took video of it last night. He says, great, because NBC was coming to interview him in a half an hour. I said, whoa. I said, first of all, I don't know what we're dealing with here. I don't know if it's a hoax. I don't know if it's military or whatever. But again, it's not about me. It's about the data. And I said, take a pic, take a copy of the video, show it to whoever so they can see what we saw. I don't know what we're dealing with. I'm out of here. <laughs> and I left because I used to do health reporting for NBC yeah. in Philadelphia in 1976 and a, and a big syndication group from that that was showing here when we moved to Phoenix in 1980 at CBS. And then I worked with NBC in the early 80s doing health reporting. And I thought, whoa, somebody could recognize me and I don't know what we're dealing with. So I left. Interestingly, that afternoon, I was sitting in front of the TV with my VCR ready. I didn't even know if they'd cover it, to be honest. You know how they do breaking news now? It was like 
breaking news with my video on every news station. <laughs> he gave it to everybody. I said, told him to share it with whoever he did. Mm -hmm. And by the nine o'clock news, there were a couple of other videos that were really impressive, including the boomerang video. And that's something you might want to look into too, because my video of the three endpoints of a giant V or triangle over Phoenix, over air or class B restricted airspace, and the arrowhead video were shot before 10 o'clock. The, there are two boomerang videos that were shot after 10 o'clock, and they're the ones that have been under fire for being flares. Whoever came up with the flare theory was brilliant because, like I said, in video, it doesn't do the lights justice. They're much smaller, they're white, they flicker, they could be mistaken for flares. Although if you look at the formations, and there actually was a fella a few years ago, and that also was on the news page on the Phoenix Lights Network website, who took updated software, stabilization software to show that the Kristen video, which is the most impressive one, the other one is a little haphazard. So they may have sent off flares. I've never denied that to, a, to take attention away from the true unknowns, but there's not one person, not one that described flare yeah. characteristics that I've ever met. Okay, so I don't know where they did it, but uh, and their story started changing. Blue Girl for Space, they said they, they did it. And David Monten said that they sent off flares because they had to get rid of them from a plane going down to Tucson. I mean, it was the stories kept changing. Um, but nonetheless, uh, here we are with um, with so, so much interesting data that, um, you know, how could I not share? How could I stick it in a drawer in good conscience? And the other thing, um, do you have any questions so far? Or, no, I'm just know. I'm just in awe at this really because I don't know if anyone else has put two and two together because what you're what you're detailing here with with events that have lasted essentially years over a vast area, you know, and some of the area is pretty limited no fly zones. Um and the fact that it, the the whole area has got this history that goes back hundreds of years with the local indigenous population mirrors exactly the same scenario that went on in a different part of the country with the skinwalker ranch and you know their indigenous uh, peoples and then and them saying also that that was a portal to the star people um and the effects that have now over the last couple of years that emerged that anyone that had any kind of uap experience there also has this effect that follows them home and it changed their lives sometimes positive sometimes negative and you're also you know you're talking about those those big human change effects as well i i just wondered well, if anyone else has ever told you about the 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 two scenarios that there and how they mirror each other um you know i've noticed that from the skinwalker ranch and there's others there's other situations and that's what we're finding out now in our study that's why anyone worldwide if you've experienced something similar to the phoenix lights and they're worldwide OK, they've been described worldwide, um, these orb formations and also the triangle craft and so forth. Um, please, you know, uh, join us with our study because we really want to be as, as meticulously scientific to quantify the, the most significant credible data as possible to show that, yes, it is true. And what also what also caught me off guard, OK, um, is that a number of witnesses to the Phoenix Lights mass sighting, also shared with me, including an MD, a medical doctor, psychiatrist, who saw one of these craft right above their car for some time coming up from Tucson, which is two hours south of Phoenix, up to Phoenix for a, a, a swim meet. He's working with me. He's one of the people working with me on this study. Actually, it's, it's, it's mind boggling that a number of people, including him, had a near-death experience as a child that was reawakened by the mass sighting. Mm -hmm. And that really hit me hard, guys, because I did too. Yeah. When I was eight years old. And I lay it all out there. Okay. And during my near-death experience, I will will be open now. And I just started sharing it. I mean, it's in the book, but um, I, I didn't want to go there until the credible data was really established. And and it seems to be now, hopefully, that it's 26 years later and nobody's explained or showed me. Okay. And we're talking about such technology 
Okay, as I said, these ores would detach from the main object and go out in the environment, and then redock with it later. Um, the massiveness, eight miles wide, I mean, come on, <laughs> um, that it could disappear when jets approached it from Luke Air Force Base and so forth. Um, the te technology is mind boggling that we haven't seen anything that even comes close in, in 26 years. And of course, now, um, uh, to the positive that the military and government are divulging that these phenomena, the UAP, uh, unexplained aerial phenomena are real. And uh, even though they won't go the next step and really admit, and I hope that comes soon, that somebody's driving them. <laughs> but nonetheless, in my own near-death experience, um, and I won't get into details, but uh, I did meet three giant beings above the earth in glowing white robes, and they had hoods over their heads. And I tried to see their faces, but I couldn't see their faces, but I felt their intense, unconditional love for me. They knew who I was. OK, and again, I, I, I came back from that near death experience. And I was very young and very naive, by the way, when it happened and no religious beliefs or anything yeah. um, with so much knowledge beyond my years and always felt everybody knew the secret and everybody was empathic and everybody was like, it was just my life. And at any rate, um, you know, and people have asked, are the three orbs outside my bedroom window connected in some way with these three beings who I have felt have been with me ever since as guides. And uh, there's so many stories I could tell where I had to make a life decision. I don't hear no, you know, voices or anything, but I get strong feelings for things yeah. and I trust it. I have come to trust those feelings and it always leads me to a positive place. That's, that's you know, number one. Number two, I started thinking, whoa, could there be a connection between all unexplained phenomena, whether it's near-death experience, unexplained aerial phenomena, out-of-body experience that have a mystical light associated with the experience. And once I started looking, I was blown away. I mean, I was blown away not only from all the very credible data I was finding worldwide about the UFO phenomena, but here I'm finding at, at the University of Connecticut, Dr. Kenneth Ring is studying this very thing, like a, a really thick book, uh, The Omega Project, or Dr. John Mack at Harvard. My very first presentation at the Tucson Medical Center was with him. And I, you know, he was more into the abduction thing, which I, you know, don't get into. I get into the contact, but it confirmed, you know, my data, my photographic data confirmed that something is going on. Somebody's behind it, right? <laughs> and yeah, so he was very grateful. And he was working on a book, actually, yeah. not only about the connection between all and explaining, we're talking about. The, and I lay it out very simply in my book, very simply. But I started finding more and more data that the experience itself, whatever the unexplained phenomena, near-death experience, out-of-body, unexplained area phenomena, is very similar. It's yes. uncanny when you really look at the data. But the most profound poignant point of the connection is the after effect, yes. the awakening, the enlightenment that happens to a person that experiences a true unexplained phenomenon. I started calling them an up, UP and up, yeah. because it was so positive. This transformation changed people forever. They felt yeah. connected to the universe, to the earth, to each other in, in a way they never, ever felt before. It really changed people. And now we're really finding from the scientific study that it has really changed people at a very, yeah. very yeah. deep level, profound level. Um, which is important for people to know. That's the next step, I think. Um, yeah. When we finally admit not only that there are there's hardware <laughs> that's it, gracing our skies and our seas, okay? Uh, you know, they were coming in and out of the ocean. Who knows how many millennium they've been there, okay? Whoever they are. Um, but there's somebody driving them, okay? Yeah. And there's also someone that is touching us at a very, very deep level not only to wake us up one person at a time, which I'm trying to do too in my own work, okay, to the reality that we're not alone in this universe, but also the spiritual beings that we are. And this isn't woo-woo. I mean, this, this really, time after time, data just speaks for itself. People are waking up to, the like yourself, 
I mean, the remote viewing in and of itself, we have so much more yeah. capability yeah. as human beings than we're being told. Yeah. And, agree. you know, it's time we got evolved. Absolutely. To the next, uh, don't you agree? It, yeah, absolutely. It's amazing, you know, because I knew a lot about the history of these events, but I didn't know so much about how much you're now starting to understand and document the um the, the essentially how much consciousness and human consciousness plays a part in what's going on with these events and i think as a as a whole ufo uap and paranormal type community we are only all just starting to wake up to the fact that there's huge implications here to to human consciousness that and uh yeah, there don't seem to be any boundaries between anything, you know, between what I'm doing with remote viewing and what you're doing when you're having these interactions with with the, with these beings out there on a slightly different level than, than we are. Um, but yeah, consciousness seems to be a major part. And I, I'm really happy, you know, it's re I'm really happy and I'm really infused to find that you're doing this extra data research that you're doing right now. And we'll, well, when we put this out, we'll put the links to all this so that people can Thank find you. All that as well. Um yeah, because, you know, we are just, we are literally just the last couple of years, I feel really becoming aware that it's not just seeing these objects. There is, there is this huge after effects thing going on that, that trickles down through people and their family, their friends and their whole lives. It's, it affects their whole lives. So, yeah. So thank you for reinforcing that and uh, yeah, sharing that with us as well. Yeah, half half of the book is about this actually, because to me, yes, it's important for people to know what happened as I shared today. And there's much more to the story, obviously. Yeah, um, yeah. But how it affected people is to me so poignant, so powerful. It's not just something in the sky. It's something that affected people and changed them forever that we have to acknowledge and we have to study. And, and that's what I always say. I mean, I don't know what these things were. But I know that they were. And it's time we get this topic out in the open, address it, accept it, and study it. <laughs> so we know we can move forward in our own evolution and find out not only who's driving these things, but also move forward in our own evolution to get to the part point where we can really welcome whoever is doing this. Um, and they'll know. They'll know. I mean, this is happening drip, 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 drip. We know that. Um, and I think we're ready for it. What do you, What is your uh, evaluation of that? Do you think that humankind at this point I is ready so. for this? I um, mean, there are there are always obviously some fractions of human society that are um, a bit more greedy in their intent, you know, a bit more selfish. But I'm hoping that the realization of this consciousness interaction with life that exists everywhere in the universe is starting to change those people and make them less, less greedy and less selfish. Yeah. I think we're, that, I think that we're would be closer. a very good hope. <laughs> it would. Yeah. Yeah. It and, would know, because it's for humankind. I mean, it's, it's just, uh, you know, if they've been here, and, you know, I mean, look, there's lots of rumors out there um, that there's submersibles that have been there. You know, who knows? I mean, the ocean, my goodness, it's 70 percent of the earth. They could be anywhere down there. Yeah. OK, for millennia. And we wouldn't know it or Antarctica, which they're talking about, too, that they could be underground. Um, and they're just starting to show themselves. And, and the one thing, the other thing that's really important to impart. And yes, it. Different people react because they come from a different background or, or whatever. Um, they might react differently. But eventually, with therapy and realizing, um, it really comes to a positive point. And there has not been one, not one report, credible report, that I've received personally. Can't speak for other things, but I can about the Phoenix Lights phenomenon. There's not one report of harm, threat, or abduction associated with the Phoenix Lights phenomena, whoever is behind that, certainly. And, and again, Native cultures have welcomed these phenomena for centuries, okay? Um, they they uh, are so open and comfortable that, um, again, there uh, hasn't been any indication of harm or threat or abduction yes. associated with the Phoenix Lights phenomena itself. So, um, anyway, here we are. I, I told you the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot more uh, lurking underneath that um, I hope your your audience will pick up the book. UK has it on yes. Amazon. Um, the uh, the ebook actually has colored pictures 
and live links if people are interested, because again, I'm an educator. So if they're interested in a topic, they can go off and, and uh, discover more. Um, and the documentary, uh, as you can see behind me, uh, we won over a dozen international film festival awards. It's a very grassroots effort, very grassroots, but the content is important and coming from the people themselves who saw it and the uh, experts in the field and the investigators. And we get into some of these topics as well, kind of gentle overview that the UAP right there, um, everyone has an interesting story. I actually shot one month after 9-11. Um, which was poignant in and of itself because uh, we hadn't seen anything yeah. that came close to the Phoenix Lights. One year after the mass sighting, and some of that footage is in the documentary, uh, there was an incredible sighting of uh, 40 miles wide, 20-minute array of straight lines and mirror images. And the final thing was a giant pyramid. I mean, there's so much more to this story. Yeah. And four of us from four different directions actually got video of the same thing happening at the same time. Because during March 13th, the mass sighting, even though there were a handful of videos, like I said, a couple of ours were before, a couple of ours were after 10 o'clock. I actually hired a geology professor from Arizona State University to try to triangulate to see where this thing was. Mm -hmm. And he got really frustrated because he realized that we took different objects. It might be different objects and it might be, and it was definitely different times, right? Mm -hmm. But here we had, in 98, uh, four different videos of the same exact phenomena at the same exact time. And I had been referred to Dr. Bruce McAbee, a Navy optical physicist, very well respected in the field, to share my, my, my data, my photo data. And I really hesitated. I have to tell you, I did not want to come forward. But at this point, I figured, you know what? I have the videos. I got in touch with him and as an afterthought, and by then I had gone back to the strips that I thought were blank. I was told they were blank and found that first, first picture, okay, when I got out to the balcony and the two lower orbs. And actually there's a negative next connected to the last picture. The only thing in that negative, that's why I really love you to explore this if you can with your remote viewers, are the two unknowns. That's it, okay. no city lights, nothing except the two unknowns okay it was that's really a weird picture and not only that but uh, i finally got a call from him because i i put the first and last picture in the packet just to find out what the closed orbs were and he says to me uh dr lynn you told me that that close sighting in 95 was only a couple minutes i said right he said are you sure i said that's what i remember he said confirm with your husband i said he won't talk about it it was very difficult to talk to him about that close sighting. Now, I remind you, he was inside. I was outside, yeah. okay, when I felt like time had stopped. And he said, you've got to corroborate. So I sat my husband down. I said, look, we don't have to talk about the close sighting, but how long do you remember it being? He said, I don't know, two, three, four minutes tops. I said, fine. I go back to Dr. McDevy. He said, that's impossible. I said, what do you mean? And anybody that's near their computer, if you look at those two pictures, again, they speak for themselves. Because he said, first of all, the two orbs, the closed orbs, actually moved, okay? Because there's skylights on the street. And you can see in the first picture, the two lower orbs on the left side of that skylight. In the last picture, when one is half disappeared, which is miraculous that I happened to catch that on film while it was disappearing and cloaking or whatever it was doing, are on the right side of those skylights. He said the other significant thing, and he was the first to notice this, the same exact phenomena was in the same exact location at a distance, disappearing while the closed orbs are disappearing. There's four in the first picture and two in the last picture. He said, but that's not the most significant thing. He said, look at the skyline. I said, okay, because I couldn't make heads or tails out of any of this. He said, there are many lights, not just individual lights, but groups of lights that are on in the first picture, that are off in the last picture. He said, that doesn't happen in a couple of minutes. He said, I want you to do an experiment. And he was very thorough with this. His 21 page report is on, on the website if anybody cares to read it. And he says, go out on the balcony, try to stand approximately the same place you were standing in 95. Mind you, this is three years later, yeah. but take pictures of the skyline one night every hour, 
one night every half hour. I actually did it another night every 15 minutes to see when these groups of lights would go out because I usually take a bath when we're home between seven and eight in the evening. So let's be conservative and say the starting time is eight o'clock. The groups of lights started going out at nine o'clock. The last picture is indicative of 10, 30, 11 o'clock. He says to me, can I present this case to the upcoming 1999 MUFON, Mutual UFO Network, International Symposium in Washington, D.C. that was coming up. I said, Dr. McAbee, this is your baby. I would have never realized this data. Just keep my name out of it, please. <laughs> I want to stay anonymous. And he was kind enough, as well as just a handful of other people who were analyzing my data at the University of Arizona and Brooks Institute of Photography and others, kept it anonymous. He presented the case in 1999 as the first, and as far as we know, the only photographic, authenticated photographic evidence of missing time. Right. That there were hours in between the first and the last picture, not minutes as my husband and I remember. Right. Um, and I never shared it with anyone actually this <laughs> until the second edition of the book because it sounds yeah. so, I still can't get my head around it. And as I told you, what I shared is what I remember. Yeah. So, you know, why is my husband, who is like a man's man, get upset when I talk about it? He was inside, I was outside. How did that picture get there of just the two objects, the two orbs, right? Without any other lights in that negative. Um, there's holes, you know what I mean, that, yeah. that I would love to connect. So, you know, that's something I wanted to share with with your audience and, and with you. There is so much more to the story, but um, at any rate, it's it's an intriguing tale. And thank you for Absolutely. letting me share it. Yeah, yeah, you know, I'm I'm aware that we've you know we've been talking now for what over an hour, so I don't want to keep you much longer on on this on this initial chat that we're having. But you know, I think that yeah, the events are so extensive. What you've gone through and what you've collected, and you know the information you've collected, I think that it's very you know there there are definite valid opportunities there for me to work with you on some remote viewing projects if you if you want to explore them further in that, that direction i would love that thank you excellent yeah we well you know after, after this is all done and we got this online and i'll put all your links on on the video and on the description as well we'll get together and see what we can do there and you know, i'll put together a kick-ass team of remote viewers for you and we'll look at we'll look at some of these events and, and see what we can see what we can identify for you it, it would be fantastic and it'd be my be my honor to, to organize this as well with you and it would be my honor to work with you as well because um i'm sure there's much more to the story that we still it's, haven't it sounds like it revealed you know, it sounds like it's uh not not just a single sighting on its own it's it's a vast series of, of events that have, you know, and they obviously wanted humans to be involved and to see this because they had the technology not to not to fly so close and, and over that kind of area for that extended period of time. And, and you know, as you've described, going back years. So they obviously are encouraging this interaction. So no, you you mentioned that actually that it happened maybe in primitive times as well, which yeah. is you know when you when you think of ancient aliens and all that that it might yeah. have happened many moons ago. Also, um, three. This is another little little aside that's really important. Three years after the mass sighting, our former Secretary of State. Uh, I'm sorry, former Vice Mayor Francis Barr was running for Secretary of State on a platform to get answers for the lights over Phoenix. And she was asking for a reenactment, which was really um, brilliant because, hey, if it's military, show us, okay, do it again. And, um, you know, shame on you for not being forthright and so forth and going right over people's heads. But nonetheless, yeah. um, this is three years later. And right before the third anniversary, we get a public announcement that three Air National Guards were coming into Phoenix. I believe it was New York, Michigan, and California, if I'm correct, to show everyone the Phoenix lights. Now, they must have been practicing for weeks because they tried to make a triangle. And the video, by the way, the footage, because everyone was ready for them, including the media. If you go on the news page, there, there it's right there. If you look at a, a box that says AZ family, you'll see what they tried to do. 
They try to make a triangle was upside down, fell apart immediately. <laughs> OK, one of them fizzled, fizzled out, the lights fizzled out. Um, and, and you could see the huge smoke trails. I mean, it was nothing, nothing like the true unknowns. And that really uh, put a nail in the coffin for their flare theory. People don't know this happened um, unless you go to my website or read the book. Um, and it's a very, very important part of the puzzle yes. because to date, the Phoenix Lights have never been reenacted or explained. And yet they continue to appear worldwide. Yeah, excellent. Dr. No, I just want to thank you uh, before we wrap up for sharing all this with us. It's, it's fantastic. And, and thank you as well for your dedication and your research all these years in, into this uh, phenomenon. Uh, it's just, it's just you know, mind-blowing. Even for me as a remote viewer that kind of saw it from a different angle, and, you know, I've been looking into UFO research for, for, for decades now, hearing all this and all the new information that you've collected as well, um, yeah, it's just blown my mind. So I just want to thank you for that. My pleasure. My pleasure. If we can move forward and help make this world a better world and uh, and, and move to the next step of enlightenment and uh, raising our consciousness, uh, as you said, that's that I think is, is a large, large part of, of all of this uh, to go to a positive place and um, make this world a better world. And uh, that's the message, by the way, that people are getting worldwide i had some automatic writing which i won't have time to share in the in the book but many people that have had near-death experiences as well as the phoenix lights experiences have shared with me that um the message across the board is wake up wake up to what you're doing to yourselves and your planet before it's too late and if that isn't an important message to get out there i don't know what is Absolutely. Well, I hope that you enjoyed and have learnt as much from Dr. Lin's candid answers as I did. What is clear from her accumulated decades of experiences and research and the remote viewing information is that this appears to be a valid UAP event or events over a long period of time, with the express reason of interaction which has an effect on human consciousness. Thank you for watching this presentation and in your support of our work. For more information on what we do and on Dr. Lin's research and media, the links are down below for this. Please like, subscribe and share for more future information. Namaste.